On the buzzbeat of this Sunday, one of the ugliest brawls in the history of Washington isn't over. Brett Kavanaugh is now a Supreme Court justice, but the hyper-polarized media debate rages on. I think one reason that Brett Kavanaugh won this is that he became one politically with Donald Trump. He was the aggrieved party uh, last Thursday. He sounded like Donald Trump in robes. They tried to ruin a man's life for political gain. It turned the confirmation process for the U.S. Supreme Court into a circus and something, frankly, befitting of a banana republic. I think for a very long time, Brett Kavanaugh is going to have an asterisk next to his name and any decision that he participates in. Today, Kavanaugh avoided becoming a verb, unlike Robert Bork before him, but he will likely carry an asterisk around with him for years. Has the press been tilting against Kavanaugh and in favor of Christine Blasey Ford? Has journalism helped inflame the passions? Have the media gone overboard in promoting the questionable claims of the second and third Kavanaugh accusers? Brett Kavanaugh writes a last-minute op-ed for the Wall Street Journal admitting he was too emotional in his often angry testimony. This as pundits keep punching away at that five-day probe by the FBI. He's doing this as a, as a PR move to try to convince people that, no, I'm actually not unhinged and I can control my temper. I'm not a partisan hack. Besides being an obvious whitewash, the FBI's report does nothing to address concerns about Kavanaugh's misleading or outright, outright false statements. The media coverage of this has been so one-sided. It has been so biased. Uh, there has been the, the presumption from the very beginning yeah. that every single allegation made against, uh, against the judge was true. Plus, a wave of women from journalists to the White House, from Connie Chung to Kellyanne Conway, breaking their silence about past sexual assaults, the impact on their lives, and why they've forgotten most of the details. We'll talk to a reporter who went public. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. The media drama went down to the wire, what will be remembered for decades as a raw, emotional, and excruciatingly personal battle over a Supreme Court seat that turned on conduct back in high school. The Senate confirmed Brett Kavanaugh yesterday by a 50-48 margin, but guess what? The political debate and the culture war is hardly over. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and a Fox News contributor. Susan Fericio, chief congressional correspondent for The Washington Examiner. And Philippe Reines, former State Department official under Hillary Clinton. Molly, we're hearing a lot of talk about asterisks. Washington Post headlines. Senators representing less than half the U.S. are about to confirm a nominee opposed by most Americans. So now that Kavanaugh has been confirmed, the mainstream media seem to you to be a bit deflated. Well, I think they lost a battle, and it was clear that they had taken sides in that battle. You saw a lot of people tweeting on social media, or you could just read it in their coverage or watch it in their coverage, that they felt very strongly that Brett Kavanaugh should not be confirmed to the Supreme Court. It showed up in how they selected their stories, how they framed their stories, how they presented the issues. And I think that this was a loss for them. I even saw Jim Acosta, a CNN reporter, tweet something like, can't you all just win yeah, here it is. He tweeted and deleted. Jim Acosta, CNN White House correspondent, uh, accused the White House of bullying the press. It's shameful. My goodness, can't you guys win gracefully? Does that mean that he and his side lost? Right. It's a. It's a. It's a admission that he had a side, and that is inappropriate for journalists. But there's no question that so many journalists had picked a side, and they are continuing to pick a side. Susan, on ABC's This Week, Jonathan Carl said at first that this was a victory for President Trump, and this was the first question that he asked Kellyanne Conway. How concerned are you that given all that went down and the way this went down, that Brett Kavanaugh will be seen as a tainted justice by roughly half of the country? Justice Kavanaugh should not be seen as tainted. So Kavanaugh won, Trump won, and we're hearing words like tainted. Well, that's a legitimate question. Look what he's just gone through. Look at the, the, the hearing, all the emotions exposed, the charges made against him repeated in the press without a lot of, you, you know, verifying on the part of the media. It was slanted against him in the media, and he did, he does walk away, fairly or not, Kavanaugh walks away tainted from this in the same way that Clarence Thomas did back when he was accused of sexual harassment during his nomination process. In that the allegations are sort of indelible. They even, just hang yeah. out there, and people remember the headlines. They don't remember all the little details. Did the media, and certainly aided by Democrats, having failed to corroborate the, the allegations by Christine Blasey Ford and the other accusers, did they move the goalpost by, in the last week, 
Philippe, making this about uh, drinking and yearbook inscriptions and what was the meaning of the Devil's Triangle and all these things that might be seen as more minor points from decades ago. I don't think so. I mean, I think fundamentally, uh, and this goes for every network, including this network, this has been a very confusing and challenging issue for weeks now. And I think what you're seeing with the media are two things. You're seeing the standard partisan reflection, which again is not specific to CNN or MSNBC. Someone could be watching now and confuse Molly. Susan and I, Molly and I have opinions. Susan doesn't. But someone might uh, just conflate us, the clip you showed of CNN, of the four people. I think all four were supposed to have opinions. But the second thing is, is that this has in some way uh, made us back to a 50-50 nation, which we haven't been since Election Day. It's been, well, I know that sounds Have I strange. missed something in the well, last no, year and because, a half? No, yes, because we've been more of a 55, 45, oh. or 60, 40 nation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the searing moments of the last year and a half, whether Charlottesville or Helsinki, have actually brought together the people who were not for Trump. And I think this is the first time we're seeing uh, a legitimate coalition of Republicans, even if they're not incredibly pro-Trump. And I think that's what you're you're seeing in okay. terms of the fever pitch. So unprecedented for a Supreme Court nominee to write uh, an op-ed piece. This was, was in Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal, uh, where uh, Kavanaugh said, I was very emotional uh, in his testimony, more so than I've ever been. I might have been too emotional at times. I know my tone was sharp, and I said a few things I should not have said. That suggests to me the criticism of the testimony about him not having a judicial temperament really stung. Well, I think so. And also, though, I think it speaks to how the media covered this issue. When he gave that speech, I think for a lot of Americans, they heard this Churchillian defense of the values of Western civilization. When the media talked about it, they said, oh, my, my, he's very emotional that we called him a gang rapist. And so there was so much pressure against him being emotional in response to outlandish charges that were never proven and were never even provable. And, and I think that that framing of it led to things like this when I'm not sure that was entirely necessary. Right, but Kevin also said things, the openly partisan things like this was the revenge of the Clintons. But let me ask you, are the media now shifting the debate? It's over. He's on the Supreme Court. He'll report for work Monday. Are the media now shifting the debate? There's, oh, he's going to be such a partisan justice. He's going to hurt the reputation of the court for decades. In other words, is this fight ever going to end? Well, I mean, to this day, I guess we're 30 years close to it, later than Clarence Thomas, and people put an asterisk next to his name. doesn't make a difference. Well, who, gives the media, who gives the media the power to bestow asterisks when somebody's been legitimately nominated by the president and confirmed? Well, but it is your job for, you know, an, an official oversight, you yeah. know, extra constitutional. And if you see a justice doing something, now, again, he sat there, and I, I agree with Molly. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to be furious and, and frustrated. What he did from there is not okay. To blame the Clinton machine for this, for his interactions with those senators, that was someone who in the course of trying to prove he could not have done this, actually showed the exact person that may have done this. So you think the media criticism over that was justified? Absolutely, because it was reflecting the, the, the criticism of people like me. I, I would be more happy with Amy Coney Barrett, who is more conservative taking the seat tomorrow than uh, Brett Kavanaugh solely because of that performance. Well, we don't know how she might have gotten roughed up in a confirmation process, Susan. I would argue, though, that the reason he wrote that Wall Street Journal op-ed had less to do with the opening part of his remarks, if you can recall, when he started out talking about his reputation and his family. I felt that the Wall Street Journal ar argument that he made was really aimed at the second part that Philippe just mentioned, which is when he started t attacking the Democrats. That's when it undercut his, his temperament and what kind of uh, justice he would be. And I thought he wrote in defense of that, that he was going to be independent. That was to assure last-minute doubters amongst Republicans, and maybe Joe Manchin, that make sure that he looks impartial on the court. What about the partisan media split over this FBI investigation that President Trump eventually ordered? Uh, about 10 people interviewed in total. Didn't change anything. The optics were not great, I think, in terms of the agents not interviewing either Brett Kavanaugh or Christine Ford. But wasn't it all predictable? And isn't the liberal and media and conservative media reaction predictable? If, if you want Kavanaugh, you like the FBI investigation. If you don't, you say it was a shame. That's legitimate. I thought the fact that there was an argument over how thorough this investigation was is a legitimate thing for the media to cover. They left out uh, a, a bunch of witnesses that was put forward by uh, Blasey Ford and Ramirez. 
and on the opposite side, you know, you had the beginning of this where they said this is going to be of limited scope and not a fishing expedition. It does raise the question, how far should we go in looking into Kavanaugh now that we're learning new things about him along the way? That was a legitimate thing. I thought the media was, was relatively fair in covering that aspect of it. So much passionate and sometimes ugly rhetoric on both sides, Molly. So, for example, Fox fired contributor Kevin Jackson, who had gone on the air and called Kavanaugh accusers lying skanks, and the network said that language was reprehensible. Have the media played an inflammatory role in what was already a raw and emotional debate that has deeply divided the country? They put forth stories that had no corroboration, and they used them to smear someone and, and put this asterisk by his name. People say, oh, there's an asterisk. That's there for a reason. There were unprovable and undisprovable allegations put forth. There was flood the zone media coverage, and the overall effort was done done to delegitimize someone. It reminds me very much of the Russia investigation that we also saw the media flood the zone and put forth stories that had no basis in fact just to delegitimize a person. This is, a, this is something that the media should not participate in. There was no daylight between democratic partisan activity and media coverage, and that is deeply problematic. Well, I mean, Molly just hit the nail on the head in terms of the FBI. For a year and a half, the FBI has just been horrible, evil uh, institution, according to Donald Trump. He fired the director. He fired the deputy director. He wants a number of other people fired. They're the deep state. Suddenly, they're the most precious institution of all time. All right, but what about Molly's contention well, that there was no daylight between the Democrats, who obviously were all geared up uh, to, to, to protest, block, delay, do whatever they could to stop this nomination, and the media coverage of allegations, although, you know, once the Democrats leaked Christine Blasey Ford's name to the press. We don't know that. Well, we do Once it was that. magic, really. <laughs> we, don't know, we don't know who did it. Okay. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't see how you could not cover that. But what about the notion that essentially the media and the Democrats were in cahoots here? I, I would say this. Um, this comes down to he said, she said. But there is a difference in motivation. If you don't believe him, you're attributing certain understandable factors to that. Maybe he didn't remember. Uh, it was a long time ago. Maybe he was drinking. He wants the job. He's ashamed. If you don't believe her, you're saying that this woman is just an outright liar. No. In this country, in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty, and that is a very important value. You're not saying anything other than evidence must be provided before you before you convict someone. You know what the media did with this? It was really interesting. Really interesting was they left out covering the the problems with her testimony, so it just made it look like she was 100% believable, rather than looking at the facts laid out the way we would if we covered a criminal case in court. We threw that aside and just said believable, believable, and then social media. Strung it all out and showed how there were big problems, and then Real Clear Politics investigations all looked into the problems and gaps in her testimony that really called into question whether she was telling the truth or not, or whether she was misremembering. Mainstream media did not cover that fairly or thoroughly, and that was a big problem her, with this. To, to impugn her credibility, you had to say she was paid by Soros, that she worked for the. You Clintons. could just say she didn't provide any evidence to corroborate her accusations, and that she is true. She herself gave that a very compelling true over the, testimony. You can believe it if you want, but. People need got, evidence. I've got to get a break. Sorry, guys. We'll try to continue <laughs> this in the next segment ahead. The female journalists who are going public with painful stories, very painful stories of past sexual assault. But when we come back, the media slamming the president for seeming to taunt Christine Blasey Ford. Is that fair? The press had actually been acknowledging that President Trump was unusually restrained in speaking respectfully about Christine Blasey Ford and her allegations of sexual assault when she was 15 until he unloaded at a rally. What neighborhood was it in? I don't know. Where's the house? I don't know. Upstairs, downstairs, where was it? I don't know. But I had one beer. That's the only thing I remember. What the president did last night was just sickening. Maybe we should only be surprised that it took him so long to do it. The media is saying that Trump's comments about Ford were a uh, mockery or an attack are the same media who thought Matt Damon's ridicule of Kavanaugh was sparkling and brilliant and daring. No, we don't know if President Trump thinks it's useful to ridicule a woman claiming she was sexually assaulted or if he just did it because he thought it was fun. But let's take a moment to reflect that the President of the United States believes it's appropriate. There appears to be no bottom. You're mean. You're attacking victims. You don't have any empathy. 
No, he's making a series of common sense conclusions about Ford's very shaky claims and shifting accounts. As we just saw, Molly, uh, media really hammered the president over this for appearing to taunt Christine Ford in that fashion, especially given that many sexual assault victims don't remember all the details of what happened. Well, people kept saying on, in the media that he was taunting or he was mocking or he was ridiculing Christine Ford. What he was doing was pointing out what anybody could see when they watched her testimony, which is there were major holes, there were major flaws, there were major contradictions. And I actually thought that a lot of the media should have been pointing this out themselves. And you didn't see this. You didn't see people going through and looking at her story, which changed over time multiple times. They never were able to corroborate any aspect of it. They spent all their time looking at ice throwing at parties and yearbook things, and they should have been actually doing what he did there. They should have been pointing out that she had flaws in her testimony. Well, if you look at the transcript, you could say, yes, he's, he's saying that if we're going to scrutinize, the media gonna, uh, and political system's going to scrutinize the nominee, let's look at the accuser. But the tone, it, to me, was unmistakably taunting. It really was about the tone and the problem with the tone and all those things you're saying, Molly, are absolutely 100% true about missing uh, the fair coverage of problems in her testimony was that you, you then he is speaking also to people who believe her and who also have had their own experiences so it looks as though he is mocking them personally and that is one of the problems with President Trump and and his tone when he addresses problems like this is Except that people had, interpret it one way and 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 it's harmful it can be harmful he previously said he found her credible which was much more than a lot of people thought when they right. first saw her testimony. and he did get some credit it, it for that reminiscent of when he was remember he was mocking a New York Times reporter yes. and, and then you explain that again it just it, 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 it doesn't sit well with a lot of people and it, reporter it just, with it, disabilities uh, uh, president oh, telling yeah. Judge Janine, um, I had to even the playing field when he did that. But Sarah Sanders and other White House officials telling reporters, no, 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 he wasn't mocking her. He was just stating the facts. And Sarah Sanders was lying. I, I, I don't understand why Donald well, wait, Trump's Why do you call it a lie? She's defending because her boss. She, okay, you're allowed to defend your boss. I don't know why you just can't say the president was making a point. And the point is what Molly was saying. Molly is conflating a legitimate conversation about this situation with Donald Trump just enjoying himself unnecessarily taunting someone. I think there's a I don't thing think that that's what was like happening. I think there's an issue where a lot of people don't understand Donald Trump's appeal is that he says the things oh, the that appeal. you're not supposed to say. It was almost silly how much deference people provided to Dr. Ford given that she had no corroboration for her allegations. He's being told you're not allowed to say anything. You're not allowed to point out that there's no substantiation for her story. He went ahead and did it and I think a lot of Americans were thinking, I, why aren't more people I saying this? I get the this? appeal of it just because something is appealing to a well, you should be able to say true things. You should be able to say true things and not be condemned for it. I, I think there's a big gap between what he was doing and Saying, the, the he wasn't example even using a mocking of tone Donald anyways. Trump wasn't mocking a reporter with disabilities. He was. Well, actually, just, that he is, just and, was. And actually, this is a good opportunity to say that, too. Donald Trump d did that mocking of that reporter, which he's done with many people. It was portrayed in the media as if he was mocking a reporter because of his disabilities. When he he's actually, he but he's actually used, hands. he's used that same mocking tone with three or four other people who do not share that disability. And that was a very, that's a very good example of a media lie let about me, something important. Let me use our last minute to ask you this question, Susan. Uh, there is a culture war debate here, the media carrying on, in which the president is talking about it's a scary time for young men and they're in danger of having their lives ruined by uncorroborated allegations. What do you mean? I mean, it's a fascinating debate being stoked by everybody, including the press. Yeah, and we've talked about this before on the show. It's, it, again, another gap in media coverage, which is the Me Too movement and even prior to that, on campuses with a sexual assault epidemic, so-called epidemic, that there is a lack of due process. We've seen it with very some high-profile cases, and we've seen it uh, in cases that are, aren't reported in the media but are reported on smaller blogs and things. Right. And, and that is carried over into this, where you have one person being accused and, and, and being found guilty before really any of the evidence is laid out. And that well, is what that, that debate about. will continue, obviously. And it was fascinating to me, the mainstream media kind of scolding Susan Collins for her 45-minute speech in favor of Jeff Kavanaugh, but very happy with Lisa Murkowski, who voted against the judge. I had Mika Brzezinski rips Kellyanne Conway for saying she's a sexual assault victim and then defending the president on Christine Ford. We'll weigh in on that, but up next. President pushes back when reporters try to turn a presser on trade into a session on, of course, Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> President Trump got some grudging cred credit from the press after striking a last-minute trade deal with Canada to replace NAFTA. Even the New York Times acknowledged this was a win. 
So he staged a Rose Garden victory lap, took questions on the agreement, and then we saw him act like the reality show producer he once was. It began when he got into it with ABC's Cecilia Vega with a little swipe that the White House later inaccurately changed in the transcript. Okay, question? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. She's shocked that I picked her. No. It's like in a state of shock. I'm not thinking, Mr. That's President. That's okay. I know you're not thinking. You never do. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. In a tweet this weekend, Mr. President, you said that it's incorrect to say you're limiting the scope of the FBI investigation. What does that have to do with trade? I don't mind answering the question, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to do the trade question. It has questions. to do with the other headline in the news, which is the Kavanaugh I know, but, I know, but how about talking about trade, and then we'll get to that. Of course the reporters were far more interested in Kavanaugh, but Trump handled this like a cable show. Hold on, hold on. We're still in the A block. Trade is the A block. We'll get to Kavanaugh, but that's the B block. I'm still doing trade. I'll tell you when. And he stuck to that with CNN's Caitlin Collins. Now that you've answered several questions on trade, I'd like to turn uh, don't, don't, to don't Judge do Kavanaugh. Don't do that. Don't do Do you have, do you have uh, excuse me, do you have a question on trade? We'll we do just, one or two more questions on trade. You answered several questions okay, on trade. Okay, don't do that. That's not nice. Mr. President, and besides that, somebody is before you. So he actually made Caitlin Collins pass the mic to another reporter, even as he later joked that people are falling asleep with trade, and stayed with the topic until, as promised, taking a number of questions about the Kavanaugh battle, including from her. New York Times ran a gargantuan piece here. It's reprinted today. Eight full pages. Let me just look at this. It goes on and on and on. Saying Donald Trump inherited far more money than he's admitted from his father, Fred Trump, a housing developer, and that they, at times, committed tax fraud by hiding massive gifts through shell corporations. The president called it a very old, boring, and often told hit piece on me. Boring is sort of his uh, worst form of criticism. But neither he nor the White House disputed a single fact. It was an impressive journalistic effort that included many confidential documents. But even the Times acknowledged that the IRS had never challenged the Trumps on any of this. And it's hardly shocking that rich people are very aggressive when it comes to minimizing their taxes. Coming up, a political columnist for The Washington Post speaks out about a long-ago sexual assault, and she's got plenty of company now in the media, politics, and entertainment. She'll be here next. As more female journalists are speaking out about past sexual assault, including one of our next guests, the spotlight has also fallen on Kellyanne Conway, who last week told CNN's Jake Tapper that she, too, has been a victim of sexual assault. But when the White House counselor defended the president's sharp words about Christine Blasey Ford, she drew a tough rebuke from one of her frequent critics, MSNBC's Mika Brzezinski. She's been treated like a Faberge egg by all of us, beginning with me and the president. He's pointing out factual inconsistencies. Tell us your story. Who's your attacker? Who broke the law? Who hurt you? You were really uncomfortable just saying, I am a victim of sexual assault. And you know what? I say that as a victim of sexual assault myself. So I want to ask, why can't you be the egg, Kellyanne, the Fabergé egg, and tell your story? Joining us now to talk about the cultural debate surrounding women and sexual assault, Karen Tumulty, columnist for The Washington Post, longtime reporter, and Emily Jashinsky, culture editor at The Federalist. So, Emily, Mika took a lot of heat from some other pundits over her very sharp criticism. Some of it was based on a kind of a distorted clickbait headline on media. Mika Brzezinski challenges Kellyanne Conway to reveal details of a very convenient sexual assault. Your take on the criticism? You know, I think the criticism was deserved for the most part. You can kind of follow her logic. What she's saying is that if you're going to cover for this president, um, you don't, you, you can't use your sexual assault as a way to sort of enhance your coverage to uh, give it more credibility than it well, actually has. I don't think has. Mika was saying that. She says she was, uh, uh, that Kellyanne says she was talking about the whole process of questioning Christine Ford. Yeah, and so she, she was also saying that if you're, if she's being treated like a Fabergé egg, then you should be able to come forward, of course, and, and name your, your alleged attacker because it's so easy. And that's, that's the, the thrust of what she was saying. But at the same time, I think what people hate about where we are right now in this conversation about Me Too and sexual assault is the way that it's gotten so politicized and nasty and personal. Right. And I do think Brzezinski was feeding that. It was an unfortunate moment, I thought. Well, Karen, Mika Brzezinski, who's a fierce critic of Trump and her one-time friend Kellyanne Conway. Uh, in fact, Morning Joe, her show, hasn't had a White House guest in about a year and a half. 
uh, told me that she would never push another woman to describe a sexual assault or to confess the details, but she was saying, hey, it's not so easy to do it in front of the cameras. And, and that actually was how I heard it. And then it was interesting, though, because the social media blowback started right away. And I think that Mika also recognized that she, she had not worded this point the way she intended to. So she really, she went back on the air the same show within minutes and I think made the point she was trying to make uh, a little more clearly. Well, uh, in our interview, Mika Brzezinski told me about the sexual assault, and I repeat this with her permission. Uh, she said this happens when she was 14. She was riding a horse in McLean, Virginia, and was attacked in the woods at gunpoint. Uh, the stranger pulled her off the horse, took off his pants, mauled her, pistol whipped her. Uh, as she was screaming, she ended up covered in blood. Absolutely horrifying experience, but she understands that not everybody is comfortable talking about that. And Karen, you went on Twitter this week, uh, in the past week, and you disclosed for the first time an assault when you were a child. Explain. Well, um, and this was in the, the, a number of things going on here. Um, it was not be because I wanted to weigh in whether or not Brett Kavanaugh had done the things that he was accused of, but the, the president had raised the point if this assault was as bad as, as Christine Ford said it was, surely she would have told her, as he put it sort of sneeringly, her loving parents and there would have been a police report. Police, yeah. And that spawned a hashtag, you know, why I didn't report. And that for me really struck home, not just in this context, but also in the context of the Catholic Church. I'm a Catholic that, you know, why are these reports coming out now so much, so long after it happened? And right, what, so explain for people who didn't read it what you... Well, what, what happened to what me was when I was nine years old and I was at a birthday party, oddly enough, uh, given Mika's experience, at, at a writing stable, uh, the man who ran the stable sort of pulled me away from the little girls at the birthday party and molested me. This was something that even though my parents, who were loving parents, I do not know that I could have come forward on this if my parents were still alive. But even though they had had the conversation with me, I somehow thought that I must have done something wrong, you know, for, for this to have happened to me. So I kept it as my secret. And I've got to tell you, you know, nine-year-old Karen felt that she couldn't tell anybody. 20-year-old Karen was very remorseful that I hadn't told anybody because I realized, you know, a riding stable, those are full of little girls. If this man did this to me... This is the guy who ran the stable. Yes, yeah. he must have done it to so many other little girls. But again, it was just not something that my nine-year-old brain could process. Right. And um, so when we have people as powerful as the president saying, this can't be as bad as these women say it is, because they didn't report it, um, I think it doesn't really understand what happens. Well, uh, Emily, I want to play some sound for you because a number of women have written pieces, have gone on the air. So let's hear some of that, starting with longtime CBS, former CBS anchor Connie Chung. I, too, was sexually assaulted, not 36 years ago, but about 50 years ago. The molester was our trusted family doctor. Am I sure who did it? Oh, yes. 100 percent. I had internalized the idea that because I had gotten drunk, I kind of deserved what happened to me and that it was somehow my fault. What happened to me, uh, which was, was basically I, I passed out and somebody molested me, uh, wasn't really considered sexual assault at the time. Kirsten Powers. So is it, is it healthy for the debate that women are now talking about this very painful subject of what happened to them? Or do you think that some of these pieces and some of these confessions were an effort to turn public opinion against Brett Kavanaugh? Two things. Yeah. Um, not only is it healthy, but it's it's critical. This reminds me a lot of the first wave of Me Too last October, um, when we were hearing so many stories that took so many women, it took so much strength from so many women to share. Um, and so the prevalence of this problem is what was originally spotlighted by Me Too. And oh my gosh, not not only healthy but critical that we hear these women's voices. The second point, um, you know, I think. It, Every woman has a right to do what she wants to do with her own story. Um, so while I think there are a lot of, you know, a lot of the women who came forward probably didn't support Brett Kavanaugh's nomination, I don't care because they have a right to say what they want to say and use their story as they want to use it. That's perfectly fine. And Karen, you made the point that you don't remember 
some of the details, and, that, and that's hardly unusual. Uh, and talk a little bit about the reaction you got from on Twitter from other women who had experiences. It was extraordinary the number of women who who replied to my tweet saying, "Oh my gosh, almost the exact same thing happened to me, except it was." My grandfather, or it was an older man at a barn, or it was, it was astonishing. And, and some said that they were 20, and some said that they were 15, and some said that they were as young as five. Yes. Yeah. And there were dozens of these reactions. And I think, you know, even here at Fox, Chris Wallace talking about how he had had these conversations with his own daughters for the first time. Mm -hmm. Even, even if you are a diligent parent. These things can happen to your children, to your young adults out there, and it's um, it's not an easy conversation to have. Yeah, which is why I admire anybody who is willing to do it. And you told me that even your own brother was shocked to hear this after all these years. So, Karen Tumbley, thanks for sharing your story. Emily Jaszewski, thanks for being here as always. Next on Media Buzz, many in the media embrace the claims of the second and third Kavanaugh accusers. Why new evidence suggests that may have been a mistake. The media gave all kinds of attention to Julie Swetnick, who not coincidentally is Michael Avenatti's client, when she made lurid allegations about attending a whole series of high school parties where she claimed Brett Kavanaugh was essentially complicit in gang rape. Can you describe to me what you saw him do? He was very aggressive, uh, very sloppy drunk, very mean drunk. Uh, I saw him uh, go up to girls and paw on them, try to, you know, get a little too handsy, touching them in private parts. Uh, I saw him try to shift clothing. A little too handsy. In other words, Swetnick backed off the gang rape insinuations. And as NBC's Kate Snow pointed out, Swetnick originally said she saw Kavanaugh spike the punch with drugs or alcohol at these parties. But in the interview, she just said, well, he was near the punch. Joining us now, Sarah Fisher, a media reporter for Axio. So why didn't NBC and other media outlets then run stories saying, hey, Julie Swetnick is backing off her key allegations and she appears less credible? I don't think it was made clear enough by people who carried the story later on that her allegations were not the same as her written statement. Why didn't they do it? There seems to have been a media pile on. Every time there's a new allegation, all the media want to clamor around it. What does this mean? What does this mean for Kavanaugh? But instead, what they should be doing is acknowledging the fact that, hey, this story might not be as credible as we might think it is. And so is some of that context loss when just sound bites are played and you don't have Kate Snow saying, well, she did change her story in a couple of key elements? That's right. When yeah. Kate Snow first reported this on Ari Melber's show, she said up front, look, there are some big differences between her written statement and what she told me in this sit-down interview. And you could see in parts of the interview that she looks a little bit skeptical. When you take sound bites from that interview and you play them on other shows or they go on other networks, that context is lost. And so you don't have the very important context that says, look, this might not be as credible as it is when it's replayed elsewhere. Yeah, I think the media were played by Michael Avenatti, who didn't really answer many questions about it. And of course, I got 100,000 times more attention because of him. All right, so The New Yorker and Ronan Farrow ran that story on the second accuser, Deborah Ramirez, who said Kavanaugh exposed himself to her at a Yale party. Even after she admitted she had gaps in her memory, she, yeah, she had to consult with a lawyer, she wasn't sure, then she was sure. And so the only source other source that Ronan Farrow and Jane Mayer had was a secondhand source. So he heard this about this from someone else. In a follow-up piece, uh, they named the Yale student who was the secondhand source, tracked down the classmate. This guy claimed told him, and that classmate said he had no memory of the incident. So what does that tell us about the original piece? I mean, it tells us that there's some credibility that could be lacking with that original piece. And if you're the New Yorker, this is a tough position. You want to make sure that you're reporting anyone that's coming forward. You want to make sure you're getting that story out. But if you're not telling it in full context, well, then the meaning of it is lost. And we're seeing now a lot of people looking back at that second story where they're saying, look, we couldn't get in touch with the person or they said that they didn't yeah. remember it. And it's really causing credibility problems for the first story. So the New Yorker is going to have to, you know, kind of find a way to tie this all together to give the due context that there might be some holes here. Yeah, I mean, I just think that while the New Yorker was transparent about the holes and the and the problems with this particular accuser in terms of her memory, um, I would question whether it should have been run at all. Obviously, it was run under great pressure because Kavanaugh was on the verge of 
being confirmed or yes. not confirmed. And in our newsroom, that's one of the things we have to look at all the time. Look, there's a flood the zone effect here where so many news outlets want to get on top of this story, so they're eager to publish things out. But sometimes you have to take a step back and say, is it even worth publishing? Yeah. New York Times, this got a huge amount of attention. A story about a 1985 bar fight in which Kavanaugh threw ice at a guy, starting a scuffle in which the guy was hospitalized, he was bleeding because a classmate threw a glass at him. Uh, Kavanaugh was questioned by police, but no, not further implicated. Was this worthy of a news story? Look, it might have been worthy of a news story if it's going to demonstrate something about his character. I mean, he is going to be on the highest court of our country, so we need to know about his character at all points in his life. But it shouldn't have been 33 author... years ago as a bar fight. Anyone who's ever been in a bar fight, therefore, is disqualified? No, it doesn't mean that. Yeah. But I do think that anyone that wants to come forward with more stories that's going to tell a little bit more about his personality, I get that. What I don't get here is why you have an opinion writer, somebody who's tweeted opinions about Brett Kavanaugh, contributing to a news story. Well, let me explain that. Because because the co-author on the story, it was a New York Times news story, was Emily Bazelon, who is a liberal op-ed writer for the paper. She also works as a staffer for the magazine. She's a lecturer at Yale. She's very smart, and she's very liberal. She doesn't make any bones about that. And she had tweeted that she opposed the Kavanaugh nomination, this is some weeks earlier, because he's a fifth vote for a hard right turn on voting rights and so much more that will harm the Democratic process. Uh, let me just briefly read the time statement. In fact, put it up on the screen. Uh, Emily Bazelon is a writer for the New York Times Magazine, as I said, who occasionally writes op-eds for the opinion section. She is not a news reporter. Her role in this story was to help colleagues in the newsroom gather public documents in New Haven, where Emily's based. In retrospect, editors should have used a newsroom reporter for that assignment, you think? Absolutely. I mean, come on, there's never an instance where someone from the opinion team should be contributing to news gathering stories on the news side. It's already really complicated enough for viewers to distinguish news from opinion in the digital age. This just makes it worse. Right. If you think that's a legitimate story reported, personally, I think it was an effort to chip away Kavanaugh's credibility by showing he had a drinking problem. But then have a reporter do it and not somebody who does opinions for a living. Exactly right. And I mean, yeah, the bar fight, it could be questioned whether or not that's even worth the publishing to begin with. All right, no bar fight here. Sarah <laughs> Fisher, thanks very much. Great to see you this Sunday. Still to come, leading conservatives complain to the Washington Post that one of its conservative columnists isn't, well, conservative. Is this a bigger problem in the Trump era? That's next. Jennifer Rubin, billed as a center-right opinion columnist for the Washington Post, is now featured as an MSNBC contributor whose views are stridently anti-Trump. Every president reminds you of someone. Ronald Reagan was dad. This guy reminds you of your abusive ex-husband. More than three dozen leaders on the right are urging the Post in a letter to stop labeling Rubin as a conservative because, quote, it is nearly impossible to discern any conservatism in Rubin's contemporary writing. And we're back with Molly. So why all this attention, you wrote about this, to Jennifer Rubin? Who cares what the Post calls her? Well, I think there is frustration that when there are almost no conservatives at the Washington Post that they would call someone like Jennifer Rubin a conservative when at least for the last couple of years she has reversed all of her former conservative positions, whether it was her opposition to the Iran deal, her beliefs on whether Jerusalem should be recognized as the capital of Israel with our embassy being there, you know, the Paris Climate Accord, conservative justices. As Donald Trump has taken the positions she used to hold, she has turned against them because she is strenuously anti-Trump. That's fine, but to bill her as a conservative or as a center-right columnist when she's not, people find very frustrating. Well, the Post gave me a statement saying it's committed to providing a variety of voices in its opinions section and have added people like Mark Thiessen and Hugh Hewitt and sometimes people from the Federalist, but didn't address the question of Jennifer Rubin, and she declined to comment. So let's broaden this. When you look at the Washington Post opinion pages, people like George Will, conservative who hates Trump, New York Times, Brett Stevens, David Brooks, Ross Stouthit, some people don't like the president. Um, and on MSNBC, you have Nicole Wallace and Joe Scarborough, anti-Trump. You had Hugh Hewitt's pro-Trump. He lost his show. Why is that? What, is this, what does this say about the way in which the opinion media deal with right. conservative media? Whether you look at newspapers, you're looking at TV shows, overwhelmingly, if someone is billed as a conservative contributor, they're of the never Trump faction, which is important because that's almost non-existent outside of the airwaves and outside of newspapers. The vast majority of Republicans are supportive of President Trump, you know, 90 percent or more. He's the most popular Republican president among Republicans in history. And yet you don't see that represented on the airwaves or in newspapers. But you're saying there are almost 
there's no conservatives in America who, who have a lot of serious qualms about how Donald Trump has performed. So according to the polls, Republican voters are overwhelmingly happy with Donald Trump. You don't see that reflected in a lot of the conversation and analysis. And you see a predominance of never Trump conservatives. Even I would say on this network, you see way out representing their actual numerical numbers. And you hear people say, oh, well, we just can't find anyone who's Trump supportive, who's a good writer. Well, that doesn't make sense on two counts. One, you see a lot of weak thinking and weak writing in the anti-Trump uh, movement that does get published. And also, I publish hundreds of, of uh, people all the time, ranging from never Trump to very Trump supportive. They're strong writers, and there are so many people you could pick and choose. So just to clarify, I mean, Jennifer Rubin on her Twitter page calls herself a conservative. You, you're not saying you can't be a conservative and also oppose Donald Trump. No, there are certainly people who uh, who identify as conservative who oppose Donald Trump, and most of them you see on TV and newspapers as opposed to in the real world. So in why is case, there why is there case, such though, a gap? Why is there such a you would say uh, misrepresentation of uh, a, a chunk of conservative opinion in, through these media opinion outlets? I think because most people uh, are based in D.C. and New York, which mm -hmm. are sort of the headquarters of Never Trump conservatism. It's not represented in much of the rest of the country. It's overwhelmingly represented here. He's a very disruptive force, not just for D.C., but also for the conservative movement as well. Holly Hemingway, great to see you as always. Thanks for doing double duty today. And that is it for this edition of Media Buzz. I'm Howard Kurtz. Check out my new podcast, Media Buzz Meter. Molly comes on once a week. We kicked around the day's five most important or fascinating stories. And you can subscribe, Apple iTunes, Google Play, foxnewspodcast.com. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter at Howard Kurtz. And we hope you'll like our Facebook page. I post my daily columns there and some original videos as well. The last few weeks on this program, I mean, it's been pretty raw and pretty emotional as we in the media and the country have dealt with the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. I'm glad the battle is finally over, but as we said earlier, it's actually not over in terms of media debate. Back here next Sunday, 11 Eastern. We'll see you then with the latest buzz.